Thank you for coming. My name is Gerard Amarit Paretas. I work as a contractor for Nordic Semiconductor. And today we are going about, uh, when we're going to talk about uh, pin control in Zephyr. Here's the outline of the presentation. So we'll go uh, with an introduction on why we have pin control, what was before, what is like now. Uh, then we'll go through the state model. That's what we have now, like the device tree part, then the API itself, and an addition that we also added like dynamic pin control and We'll finish with some conclusions. Um, so let's start with introduction. So what is uh, pin control? Um, pin control is basically two things. Uh, one is like pin multiplexing. So for example, uh, I'm gonna put URTX signal to pin uh, 26 or PA0, depending on the vendor. And uh, there are like other settings like pin configurations that sometimes are required to make a peripheral to work. Like it could be, for example, for an internet signal, you need to set the the driver strength to the maximum level or the slew rate to the fast uh, state and this, this sort of um, parameters. And pin control is something that is uh, essential for SOC peripherals to work. So it's something that even if you don't like it, you need it. Uh, you cannot really avoid it. And another point about pin control is that uh, it's heavily vendor or SOC specific. So I've learned through all this process of pin control that, I mean, uh, yeah, hardware designers can be really creative. Uh, you can see, yeah, starting with Nordic, it was, uh, yeah, it was like, an, it seems easy, but it's really not. Then you have like NXP, you have a ST. I mean, it's totally different. So it's really hard uh, to make something generic as we'll see. So um, before continuing, I, I also want to make a distinction between pin control and GPIO. Uh, it's, we often have this question because uh, in many cases, you have like overlapping functionality between GPIO and pin control, uh, because sometimes the same IP block controls, uh, for example, the GPIO parameters like the pull up, uh, you would use the same registers if you are writing like the pin as a GPIO or if it's driven by a square C, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the distinction we made with pin control is that uh, pin control is uh, proposes to both multiplex and configure uh, the pin parameters. And this only happens when you are you, like the pins are driven by an SOC peripheral. So, for example, when a pin is connected to the IS core C, then it's pin control the job to, to configure that pin. But when you are manually controlling the pins, then it's the job of the GPIO driver. So, it's kind of the distinction we have right now in Zephyr. Uh, it's, I see like sometimes GPIO as a subset of pin control because in GPIO you don't configure the multiplexing normally. So, uh, maybe in the future, because now you can see actually in the tree, there's some duplication between the GPI and the pin control uh, drivers. Maybe we can reuse something. Let's see. That's not like this right now. So, um, yeah, before Zephyr uh, 3.1, which is the, the, the last release that was cut, I think, last uh, Saturday or Sunday, uh, pin control was, yeah, as this photo shows, a bit of a mess, really. Uh, let's be honest. So each vendor had its own solution. Uh, we had an API, which, is, which was called PinMax, but yeah, it had design limitations. Nobody used it. It was used in a, in a, in a weird ways in some cases. So yeah, it was not, uh, yeah, it was not a real uh, API in the end. And then in the, in the device tree part, uh, we also had like variety. So it was no, nothing standard at all. Uh, some examples just to illustrate uh, this problem. This is how kind of a Nordic did pin control. So we had this nice TX, RX, and pin properties. We have this custom stuff to enable, for example, pull up in the UR. And then each driver internally managed, you know, the configuration uh, in, in the case of Nordic. Uh, in the case of ST, things were a bit better. Uh, this is actually like, like a pre-pin control work. Uh, uh, I did, uh, Erwan and myself actually work on that. I think a couple of years ago now. Uh, so things were a bit better because the, yeah, the, the device tree part was kind of following the Linux model, but then again, we had like custom APIs inside the driver. So it was, yeah, it was a kind of a mixed uh, solution. And then we had, here we have another example where uh, this is for um, uh, IMX. Uh, everything was done at board level with custom half code. So, you know, if uh, it was, there's, there was, and there are more cases, so, but you can, you can, you can get the idea it was, yeah, depending on the vendor. So uh, starting from Zephyr uh, 3.1, well, actually the pin control API was introduced in Zephyr 3.0, so one release ago, but I think we only had one or two drivers there. So it was like kind of a initial phase. Um, this API, what does is standardize a few aspects of pin control. So we have like, uh, yeah, less vendor dependent solution. The first thing is that we, 
we really look at oh, what 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 mm, what Linux does. I mean, well, let's. I mean, they had the same problem years ago. They tried to solve it. Let's see what they what they've done. And we took from Linux the kind of the state model that we will see in a few slides. What that means. Then what we've done is like a standardize some common properties. Like for example, if you want to enable the pull up, uh, you will use this device three B as uh, pull up uh, for all the vendors really. Uh, and then uh, all the vendor specific uh, stuff uh, that it's kind of, I would say inevitable because of the variety we have in hardware are contained in device three. So there's nothing uh, in drivers anymore in, in SOC uh, file, uh, board files, you know, everything's like in device three and an SOC specific header as we'll see. And the other thing is that all drivers use the same mechanism, the same API to configure the pins. So we don't have like this custom SD code, then we have like one is in board file, so everything's like follows the same pattern. And the thing is that uh, starting from Zephyr 3.1, any new platform that uh, is, uh, you know, brought to Zephyr, will need to implement pin control. We no longer want these custom solutions because it was uh, really a mess. Um, so let's continue with the state model, which uh, the state model uh, was really inherited or the, the concept is comes from Linux really. Uh, the thing is that some drivers, uh, some peripherals need certain um, configuration to work correctly, as I said at the beginning. Uh, so that includes the signal multiplexing and the certain pin properties. And in some cases, uh, the requirements also change at runtime. One typical case is that when you go to low power, you, you need like to configure pins in a certain mode so that they don't leak current and stuff like that. Um, there's more like if you have peripherals that are, have like multiple speeds, sometimes you, not, you need to reconfigure certain properties. Uh, so yeah, it's not like you just configure the pins once and everything works as they, or stays the same all the time. So what the state model does is uh, each uh, peripheral state, as the, the name says, is uh, uh, encodes this, this configuration. So each, each state, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, each configuration is modeled as a state. So for example, the defaults will see the default state encodes the configuration for the operating conditions, the sleep state encodes the configuration for the, uh, when the peripheral is in low power mode and so on. And the good thing about the state as we'll see is that uh, isolate the driver code from pin configuration. So a driver just applies a state, it applies the default state, it applies the, it applies the, the sleep state and, and so on. So there's no more pin stuff inside drivers. Uh, so here is an example. For example, for uh, for an S per C uh, peripheral, we have the default state on the left. Uh, for example, for the SDA uh, signal, we have that encoded in the state. The pin will be PA zero. The drive mode will be open drain, and low power mode configuration is not enabled in this case. Uh, similar uh, stuff for the SCL signal. And then for the slip state, we have that the drive is not set, so we don't care about the the, the mode in that case but we need to enable, for example, the low power settings of the pin and the same for SCL. Uh, so let's uh, talk about states. Uh, in general, states can have arbitrary names. Uh, however, uh, there's a naming convention for common, uh, for common states uh, because like when, for example, all the devices need like, need, like an operating uh, state, uh, like, which, is, which we call default. And uh, we also have another standard state, which is a sleep state, which is when the peripheral goes into low power mode. So actually, these names again come from Linux. Uh, so we kind of uh, inherited this as well. And the advantage of uh, standard state is that, for example, one, one typical example is that for power management, uh, it brings certain consistency. So I, I know that when a peripheral goes into low power mode, I need to define the configuration for the pins into the sleep state whatever, I mean, I don't care about the vendor or anything. I know that I need to use that, that state. Then uh, in some cases, you also need custom state as well. So maybe default as and sleep will be not enough. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, you need that. And, and I know that I think NXP is using that in some peripherals. Uh, so the actual uh, uh, API allows you to define custom states. The solution is like, uh, the states are defined like this in, in, the, in the pin control API header. So you can define uh, any state like pin control underscore state underscore the name, whatever you want. They just need to start like uh, from this, uh, from this uh, identifier so that they don't collide with the standard ones. So for example, uh, let's say that we have a peripheral that 
you know, it, you need different um, configuration depending on the bus operating speed. Uh, so we need like an, a slow state and a fast state. Uh, well, so that's easy. I just define these two states, uh, the pin control state is low and the pin control state fast. And as you can see here, they start from the, this private or custom identifier and they just keep increasing. You could use an enum as well for that. That would be probably easier. And there is another feature that the API allows is like uh, what happens when a state is not required. Uh, but I still want to put it in device tree because, you know, in, for example, if I have a board that I want uh, to build without power management support for whatever reason, but I want to have like the same device tree, I want to define the states for the default state and the sleep state, but I don't want like the sleep state to be stored in ROM when I don't compile for power management. So there is a way to do that. And actually the pin control API for the sleep state already takes care automatically of that. Um, so uh, if you define uh, a macro like this, uh, pin control, skip, and the name of the state that expands to one, the pin control API will just ignore that, that, that state from device tree and will just, just uh, discard it really. So as I said, for the sleep state, this already happens. So if you have like a PM device uh, disabled, uh, the sleep state in device tree will just get discarded. So it doesn't waste uh, extra ROM. So let's jump into the device tree representation. Uh, the first, uh, let's continue about talking about states. Uh, the states in, in device tree are represented by this pin control dash uh, N properties. So each property uh, uh, represents a state. So for example, pin control zero is one state, pin control N is another state, and you could have what uh, N, N states really. And then the name of each state, uh, it's like provided by these uh, pin control names. So for example, the the entry zero of this uh, of this uh, property would match uh, this state and the n one would match this one. So that means that pin control zero represents the default state and pin control n represents the my state in this case. This is the same, the same case in Linux. So again, we inherited that. Uh, uh, so it's really, really the same. And the content of these nodes, as we will see, that depends on the vendor. That's where we have like, each vendor can decide whatever uh, they want to put here, as we'll see in a, in a while. So um, to represent pin configurations, uh, there's no single way to do that. Uh, there are multiple ways. And we actually, when we implemented this API, we had like a broad discussion on whether we should standardize that or not, or if one, one approach was better than the other. There was no real consensus. Uh, so we said, okay, let's like provide some guidelines, uh, what we think is good. But then if a vendor comes with something that, you know, they have in Linux that's existing or they want to do something else, I mean, something else, that's, that's possible. But in the end, uh, all, the, all end up encoding the same information. So the pin multiplexing and the pin configuration parameters, whatever the representation you use, all encode the same information. So it's really a matter of taste. Some vendors may prefer one choice. And, yeah. Um, and in the documentation, you'll find that there are like two popular choices. Uh, one is like uh, what we call grouping and the other is node-based. Um, so we'll see them in a moment. But uh, the, other, the other important thing is that we, what we really wanted is to standardize the properties. So for example, uh, the typical case is like a pull-up. So if, you're, uh, if you want to enable the pull-up, you will just need to use this property. You cannot come up with like, oh, I will name something like uh, my pull up. No, because you know, that's one of the, one, one of the objectives of pin control was to standardize stuff. So we tried to, to get that. And again, this comes from Linux. So even though Linux, not all vendors do, do this uh, as far as I know, but they, they have like these names standardized as well right now. So we have, uh, these are predefined. There are a lot of properties. It's not only pull up, you have a slew rate, you have, uh, pull uh, the drive modes, you have many of them that are quite common across vendors. Um, so yeah, they are defined in these two, in these two uh, binding files. So let's talk about, uh, uh, about these representations. Uh, we'll start with a grouping approach. Uh, in this approach, uh, you can group like uh, multiple signals that same, that's, um, share the same pin configuration. And it's, uh, it's nice because you have like all the pin configurations um, for a particular state enclosed in a single uh, device tree node, as we will see. 
And the current platforms using this approach are, for example, Admail, GigaDevice, Nordic, NXP. NXP is a little bit different from this, uh, from, from the example we'll have because they don't use defines, but well, it will, well, you can check really, but it's the same concept uh, or Raspberry Pi, for example. And this is how it looks like. Um, so uh, here we have the configuration for the default state. For, for example, let's take peripheral zero, which is a random peripheral. This node in device three encodes the whole configuration for uh, the default state. And you have like groups. So for example, group one is like, okay, this is the this is the pin max for uh, signal uh, A that I want to route to the pin PX0. This is the configuration for signal C that could be Rx, Tx, SDA, for S, 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 M, whatever. This is just a generic example. And this is like the, the multiplexing, right? And then uh, you set here the properties that are common for all the signals that you are multiplexing. For. So in this case, the pull up uh, would apply to both signals. So that that helps to create less verbose in control files a little bit. And you know, and if you have a signal that doesn't has doesn't have a pull up, for example, you just have another another group that has no pull up. Okay. And uh, in the previous slide, uh, we had this uh, these entries here. Uh, so some vendors uh, predefine this with valid combinations. So we have something like this. Uh, this is not mandatory, of course, or for example, in the case of Nordic, where you have like freedom to choose whatever you want as a pin uh, for a peripheral, it didn't make sense. So you just code the pin number and that's it. Uh, but some vendors like it could be, uh, I don't know, for example, a Raspberry Pi or uh, yeah, Giga device. Uh, you have like each pin can take us, you know, a fixed set of combinations. So like, yeah, you can provide this predefined valid combination so you make your life, is, life easier to developers because they don't make mistakes, basically. Um, so that's, that's, an inter that's interesting. Um, yeah, and so this is how uh, the previous state gets assigned to a peripheral. So you would basically uh, take the pin control zero property, you would assign the, the node that describes the peripheral default, and you would say, okay, this the pin control zero, it's the default state. Then there's another approach. Uh, it's a little bit different, um, and it's uh, it's based on a, a state gets a set of nodes, so not not a single node that encodes all the configuration, but instead n number of nodes that each one encodes a particular configuration. Uh, so that approach uh, requires to have a node per pin and per state. That's important. So you cannot like reuse uh, a single node for two states because the configuration is different. Um, and I, I usually recommend this approach if you can predefine uh, nodes because it tends to be verbose when you write it by hand. So, but if the vendor provides like predefined, like for example, ST, uh, it's quite handy. And there are platforms that are using this like ITE, Microchip, Renesa Zarkar, ST, TI, I mean, yeah. So this is how it looks like. Uh, so uh, in the pin control node, you have this, like, uh, as I said, typically not always predefined nodes. So for example, this node here uh, defines uh, like for peripheral zero, uh, the signal A goes routed to the uh, PX zero. Uh, and here you have like the pin max configuration that encodes the same information as the name in this case. Uh, yeah, this is important. Just uh, this is one technicality uh, just to, because when you generate and when device three gets parsed doesn't you know generate uh, extra stuff that it's not used uh because in the question I, if i remember it was the case of nxp where they have like thousands of combinations uh when the device three gener generates that header file it had like 100 100 000 lines so it was slow in the compilation and with this uh if you don't use any this predefined node it will just get discarded and you don't get extra stuff in the in the header file uh, but again, I mean, there's no, uh, you can, I mean, as a vendor, it's an option if you want to provide these predefined uh, uh, combinations, the users can do by themselves, of course. And in this case, the, the recommendation is that if you want like, uh, like the generated uh, nodes don't have like any property, like there's no pull up here, for example, but in the board file, if you need, for example, to set the pull up, uh, you would just do something like this. So you look kind of uh, at overrides uh, in the in the board level file. So let's say that for signal A, I need to enable pull up. So I, you would just you would just do something like that. 
And this is how it looks uh, from a peripheral perspective. So here the state gets all the like um, all the signals. Uh, yeah, there's not like a single uh, like a single reference, uh, but yeah, it's like the same. You just say, okay, this pin control zero represents default, and these are all the pins that are assigned. Okay, so now let's jump into the pin control API. Um, so pin control drivers, uh, we try to make uh, things simple. Uh, so there is a single pin control uh, driver per SOC. That's what really makes sense because you usually, the, the pin control really applies for SOCs, not like for, for sensors, stuff like that. So it's really a singleton. So it's not actually an struct device. Uh, as uh, if you look at the code, there's no struct device for pin control really. And we try it as well to make things simple. So pin control drivers just need to implement a single function call, which is this pin control configure pins, which basically receive like, uh, you know, the configuration that needs to apply. Just believe that configuration is true. It applies it. That's done. It doesn't care about states or anything, or anything like that. It just gets pin configuration. That's it. And then uh, the vendor specific bits uh, are defined in a special header, which needs to be in the include path, which is pin control underscore SOC dot H. And it must define two things, the pin control sock pin time, pin uh, type, uh, which is like an opaque type that it's used to, to store uh, all the, the pin uh, configuration. Uh, that's vendor. So some vendors need to encode, you know, like uh, different, like, uh, for example, in Nordic, we encode the peripheral, the pin, uh, the port and the number, uh, ST encodes the, 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 the multiplexing number. So it depends on, on, the, on the vendor. You can, you can really put whatever you want here. It's up to the vendor. And then you need to define the macro uh, that takes care of uh, what they call device tree parsing, which is really device tree macrobatics, as this morning <laughs> was said. It, uh, it can get a bit complicated. And there is like a test or yeah, reference implementation that uses the grouping approach in the test folder in case, you know, now we have many drivers, so you can look at how vendors implemented them. But at the beginning, we had this one um, that also serves to test uh, the pin control API as well. So let's, let's go through an example. Um, I will use the grouping approach. So this is how the bindings look like. Uh, in the grouping approach, you inherit uh, from this uh, node group, which predefines the valid properties. And because uh, all the properties get assigned to grandchildren, grandchildren device tree nodes, you have this child binding, child binding, and property, the properties that you allow. So for example, if you have a pin control driver that only allows to configure bias, you will only have this, but you could put here, for example, the, the, the open drain, the drive open drain, uh, yeah, the sort of uh, standard properties. And the same here, because the information is kept in, in, in the grandchild, in grandchildren uh, nodes, you have this yeah, double child binding uh, stuff here, and you have the pin max property. This is how the uh, representation would look like, uh, really similar to what we saw before. This is why we have, you see that we have pin control, we have the state, we have the group, so the properties are like in a, grandchildren from the perif from the pin control uh, device, right? So this is why we had this two level. And here I wanted, I mean, we are not going into a lot of details uh, that can get complicated, but this is an example of how the, uh, the device tree parsing would work like for the grouping approach. So um, yeah, it, it takes in this case, the, the node stored in the first, uh, the first index, for example, for pin control zero, uh, you have peripheral default, as we saw in the example, right? So you, you would have like here, this, this node here. And uh, what this macro does, it uh, iterates over all its children, uh, okay? So it does, it's using this DT for each child uh, with uh, variable arguments, because we want to go through all the groups to get all the configurations, right? So if we had two groups, we want to get the configuration for the two groups. Okay, later. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and, and in each group, uh, what it will do is uh, to take all the pin max elements and call this initializer macro that we will see in a moment. So yeah, it, it takes a while to get used to this language. It's a bit, a bit complex. Uh, so at, at the beginning, I remember I was not sure if the, this sort of things would be possible in device three, but yeah, we are like kind of at the, the, the limit of what device three allows in, in Zephyr. Um, yeah, and this is like the, as you can see here, I am like 
calling this initializer for uh, per pin. And this is how it stores the information. In this case, uh, for example, that opaque type that I was talking about, it's just a UN32. I can encode all the information. Yeah, sorry. Five minutes left. Okay. Okay, I'll try to go fast. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just uh, this ex uh, stores uh, all the all the information like this. And this is how it would like. Uh, this is how that all that macro combination expands for the example we had before. Uh, so yeah, it's nothing really magic here. So yeah, in the case of drivers, uh, the way like from a user perspective, so, so from a driver perspective, not from a pin control uh, implementation in perspective, this is how it's used. So a peripheral needs to include this uh, predefined this uh, this uh, uh, binding file which already predefines the pin control zero to four properties and the pin control names. So you don't have like to define them manually in every peripheral. And yeah. And in the drivers, uh, there you need to basically do two things. One is to define the, invoke this macro so that you, all the pin control gets, uh, you know, defined and, you know, parsed and, and, and stored in, in, the, in defining the driver and then store a reference in the driver itself so that when you want to apply the configuration, uh, you can do it. So here is an example, very quick. Uh, this is how you usually define a, a device. Uh, so before, one of the first things you would do is to define the pin control information. This automatically takes care of doing you know, all the magic for you, like taking the default, the slip state, uh, getting all the properties uh, you know, and in, a, in, a, in a generic way. So it doesn't care about the vendor or anything. And then in your driver configuration, you would typically store a reference to that configuration so that later you can apply the configuration. Yeah, in Linux is is different because the struct device itself contains a reference like that. But in Zephyr, we wanted to like save some ROM because only SOC the devices really need that information. A sensor doesn't need that, for example. So we wanted to save a pointer from devices that don't need it. And this is how a driver would uh, would apply the configuration. So it's just about okay, I need to call pin control apply state. This is the that uh, pointer that I was talking about and the idea of the state I want to apply. So for example, if doing power management in the power management callback, you would just do the same, but instead you would do pin control state sleep or a customer state if you have customer states, doesn't really matter. And just to finish uh, the last part, uh, there was also another feature we added to um, pin control, which is called dynamic pin control, which is about uh, the capability of changing pin configuration at runtime. So let's say that you have like two boards that are slightly different that you had to route the, you know, the UR to another set of pins because you, know, you had this, uh, I don't know, for whatever reason, uh, but you want to run the same firmware, uh, even though in Zephyr is complicated because device tree is like hard coded. So when you compile device tree like disappears and you get like configuration for that specific board. Uh, in, in, the, in pin control, we added this capability because it was like some, people kept asking for this functionality. So it said, okay, it's not super complicated to add it. So let's, let's make the, uh, that available. So uh, you, when this is enabled with this kconfig option, what happens is that the pin configuration is stored in RAM instead of ROM so that we can swap the states at runtime, not the configuration from device three, just like the, the pointers that uh, keep the states. And you have this API so that you can update the whole uh, set of states. The only limitation is that it's uh, it's for devices that are not uh, initialized uh, because when a when a device is like running, you don't know what's going on, so you need to be careful of, of you cannot like change the pin con the pins whenever you want. Like, you, the device needs to be like uh, in a, in a predictable state, and we don't have like the capability in Zephyr to uh, disable devices right now. You can suspend it, so maybe it works in that case, but you know we don't have any guarantees really. And here it just uh, there's an example in tree which is in the uh, in this uh, in this folder, uh, which it's run it runs on an ordi board, but it's really applies to any vendor. Um, so that when uh, the board uh, boots before the UR gets initialized, actually, we have like a sysinit function that uh, if you press this button here, it will uh, route the the UR to this set of pins, and if you don't do anything, it will just keep using the the default. Sorry, this is the default and the alternative one. So yeah, this is, uh, uh, I guess we don't have time to go through all the details, so I will just go straight to the demo. You can check the code if you want. It's like well explained in the sample as a readme. Um, so yeah, we can maybe run the demo. So it's, uh, yeah, so here I have like two terminals. Uh, one is connected to the UR that it's 
uh, connected to the default uh, set of pins, and this other one is connected to the uh, with another uh, yeah another uh, UART adapter to the alternative set of, pin, of pins. So if I, uh, for example, reset the board, like Zephyr will keep like putting into the default uh, the default uh, pins, but if I hold the button uh, one, which is the the one that I'm checking at early stage, and if I reset the board, the UART will be routed to that set of pins at the runtime. Okay, so that you know, can be useful in certain uh, applications. And yeah, so that was on, was on the slides. And to finish some conclusions, uh, yeah. What we've learned really is that pin control is heavily vendor dependent. So it's something that's not easily portable. Uh, however, the state model allows us to isolate drivers from, from pin configurations. You have this pin control apply state and that's all. So you have no pin side in, pins inside drivers or anything like that. Um, the state model also have some advantages, like we have uh, this, we have like a generic solution for this sleep or low power modes. So in us, all the drivers that need to go to low power mode can use this sleep state for pins. So there's no like custom quirks in the drivers again. And another good thing is that we managed to standardize uh, or partially standardize the, the device tree part with the uh, common properties. Like whatever you are, if you are going with uh, Nordic, uh, ASP32, uh, STM, to enable a pull-up, you will just use this property all the time. And the other good thing is that all the vendor-specific stuff is kept in device tree and in an SOC specific. So it's like really well uh, contained. We don't have like stuff spread everywhere like we had before in board files, in drivers and everywhere. And yeah, and dynamic pin control can be useful um, because yeah, in some applications you, you have, you need this flexibility. So that's, that's an option. So yeah, thank you. Uh, if you have questions, so yeah. And you have like the slides in this URL. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, for, for doing the actual pin bolt flexing, are, are there like the uh, you know, web tools like they are like there are for Linux? I know those need to be vendor specific, but like the vendors provide those types of tools. So the question is if vendors provide like kind of a tool to uh, do the pin control, like, or at least these definitions, right? Uh, I guess you mean. Um, I think there's no like, for example, a GUI tool, like for example, ST for the MP1 has like this uh, cube uh, tool that you yeah, automatically generates the pin control stuff, uh, the device tree files actually. So in Zephyr, I think we don't have something like that. Uh, the best we have really is that this predefined header. So that for example, for ST, uh, for Giga device, you just include the uh, uh, a, a DT file that predefines the valid combinations for your packets. So you know that the choices that you will make there are valid. So you don't make a mistake like, oh, like with a valid combination because the driver itself, it will just apply that configuration. It doesn't really care if it's valid or not, right? So you have this, uh, these facilities. But and, and in case of NXP, I think they have like a Python script that automatically generates as well the pin control file. But I'm not that familiar with that one. But yeah, I think that's the best we have, but not like a GUI as yet, I think. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? The question is if uh, UART pins can be changed at runtime. Yeah. Um, yes, you can, uh, if you use the dynamic pin control. So what I've just showed here in the example. Uh, so this is a good example where how it can be done. It's for a Nordic board, but the same concept applies to any other vendor, really. So, it's, yeah, just we we did it for Nordic, but it could be SD or whatever else. So yes, the answer is yes. Yes. Um, the question. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. The, the question is, Nordic has two, UR, two type of URs, one that has two pins and the other, like, it's like the ERTS and CTS. Um, well, from, from a pin control perspective, that doesn't really matter. And in the end, you could use uh, when you configure, I guess, yeah, here, for example, if you don't care about like the flow control signals, like the RTS and CTS, you just don't in, uh, define them in the in device tree and uh, in the, the pin control part. So yeah, it's it's up to you. if. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
if you don't need them, you just don't will uh, configure them here in the PCLs property. Depends on the application, really. Uh, uh, yeah, depends. <laughs> Can you repeat? Okay, guys, I'm going to. Yeah. So if I understand the question is uh, what can firmware recommend to hardware designers to make pin control easier, right? Um, well, <laughs> as I said, uh, yeah, hardware designers can be really creative in pin control. So like, like some vendors, like for example, Nordic give, gives you a lot of freedom. You can root, I mean, every peripheral to almost every, every uh, pin, but that comes with a cost. I mean, if you ever have, uh, have like a high speed peripheral, don't do that because you have EMC problems for sure, right? I mean, you cannot like take a, an Ethernet high speed signal to everywhere and like oh, it, it will work all the time. And no, that doesn't work like that probably. Uh, but at least it would be really difficult for a hardware designer to achieve that, I guess. Um, so I th for me, I mean, as a personal uh, uh, preference, I, I like the ST model that you have like each pin has a, subs, uh, you know, a set of function, functions assigned because from a hardware perspective, you. you and, and that what ha what happens in practice is like the high speed signals only get a single choice or two choices at most because you know the, when you make the electrical part you need to be careful about routing high speed signals right so that that's I guess the best best recommendation for low for low power uh, sorry for low speed peripherals I you don't really care probably it will just work right so that's I guess my recommendation so for example the Raspberry Pi has the same model as ST I guess NXP is quite similar as well but it is just a bit more complicated but yeah like but the Nordic solution, it's uh, it's nice, but from a hardware perspective, it's I guess it's complicated. So, yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. So thank you very much.